Welcome once again to the cow report. And uh, I think we're on the air here. Hope we are. And as usual, we are coming to you live from the Ellie Phillips Library in beautiful downtown Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And this is the cow report, and I'm your host, Chuck Lee. And it's been a beautiful weekend, Fred, and of course, when yes. I speak of Fred, I'm speaking of Fred K. Stafford, former member of the United Nations and past uh, commander I'm of the American never, Legion. Never a member of the United Nations, Chuck. There's there's Fred, as you can see on the... Hi, uh, folks. That's Fred K. Stafford, and with us tonight, we have a special guest, Fred. Yes. And with us tonight is Byron Dale, and he's with the Coalition to Reform Money, and he's came to us all the way from... Uh, Chatsfield, Minnesota, or pretty close to there. Yeah, anyway. it's awful close. And you are a monetary expert, and we're going to have a lively discussion tonight, and we will be taking calls on the cow phone, and of course that number is 839-5067, and we have uh, a battery of uh, operators waiting eagerly to take your phone calls. So um, I want to welcome you to the program, Byron, and also, as usual, Fred. Welcome. And uh, thank you, Chuck. Nice you could Pleasure be. Pleasure to be here. Glad you could be here. And uh, got a call there already. Yeah. Uh, we do have calls coming in, and we're going going to first uh, mention that uh, a very co close friend of uh, Fred Stafford's died last week, and uh, many of you probably saw the obituary in the. Uh, Leader Telegram, uh, Donald Overman, past uh, uh, city councilman and uh, very heavily involved in uh, uh, Veterans Affairs, Fred, over the last uh, close to 50 years. Right. And Fred, you knew Don real well, and uh, you're both members of the uh, Catholic War Veterans and many groups, and he was a uh, past uh, prisoner of war during World War II. Yes, and he was. So he gave a, a quite sacrificed a lot for this country and maybe you'd like to say a couple words Fred you were at his wake tonight I, I was and uh, be very frank with you I complimented his family and told them they could be proud of what he did not only for his country but for uh, the veterans he was always interested in seeing that the veterans got what they were promised but I also said as a councilman in the city of Eau Claire you have further right to be proud of him because he took a stand on behalf of the taxpayer and he was opposed to spending for things that we didn't need and would have limited use. Uh-huh. Yes. Well, I, I think we're on the air, Fred. They didn't catch you on there on that last speaking engagement there. Yeah. Okay, there we're back on now. They had the camera on me. Of course, Fred, that's Cliff and Chris Economaki in the uh, engineering suite back there, Fred. They're fresh back from their trip to Hawaii where they went for an unsuccessful operation to get a separation, Fred. A grueling 20-hour operation failed, so they still are the Siamese twins of engineering, Fred. Just mm -hmm. wanted to let, let you know. Okay, we do uh, send out our uh, respects condolences to, condolences to, to Don Overman's uh, wife and family, Fred, and uh, you know, he took a little heat on the city council there for his beliefs and got accused of being a racist just because he called somebody colored. Well, in his lifespan, that's what uh, black people were called. Of course, now I'm going to get trouble for calling them black. You know, oh, you I, don't, I don't think there should be any name. I think they ought to just be no. called uh, uh, human beings, but uh, he called them colored and got in, all, in a world of trouble over Yeah, that. I know. There's some people blow up things, anything to discredit another person. Instead of looking and understanding and being tolerant of another one's views, they become very intolerant, and they were intolerant of Don. And uh -huh. I'm proud to have known him, I'm proud to call him a friend, and tomorrow I'll be a pallbearer for Don along with uh, the heads of five other veterans organizations here in town. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there'll be a major turnout because he was, like I say, heavily involved for close to 50 years in the uh, Veterans Affairs. Okay, Fred, we're going to take a call here real quick because right. we do have a few people backed up. Go ahead, caller, you're on the air. 
you, a stupid fool. Well, do you have anything else you'd like to say? Yeah, you're... Okay. Thank you very much. Well, we lost that one, Fred. Uh, once again, that shows you, Fred, that after 12 years of education, 13 counting uh, kindergarten, at almost $7,000 a year, these people can't even speak English when they get on the phone. Isn't it amazing? Yes. What's it going to cost to get a good, a well-educated person? Well, I don't know. I don't think we have <clears throat> that much money. Okay, our subject tonight is money. What is money? Um, where does it come from? Is it the root of all evil? Is it the, uh, the uh, what makes the world go around? Um, is there love, love is what makes the world go around there, uh -huh. uh, Chuck. Does money make you happy, make you sad? We're going to find out tonight can with... Help. We're going to find out tonight can with... help you make it both ways. <laughs> with Byron Dale, who is a monetary expert. And I just wanted to give a brief background, Byron. You, you have 18,000 hours, over 11 years in research study and communications on the monetary system and its effects on people. That's correct. And you've given over 750 lectures on the subject. And you're qualified in several courts, including North Dakota, Minnesota, and Missouri, as a monetary expert. That's correct. So you're not a fly-by-night uh, penny pincher. <laughs> no, I'm not. Or whatever. They might call you so. <clears throat> I think we have a call on line two, and hopefully this will be an educated call, Fred. Go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Hi. Um, are you one of them? Uh, supporters of legalizing marijuana. Uh, legalizing marijuana. In what form? <laughs> um, form of any form. No. Uh, well, Fred's not. Uh, the only way I would uh, consider legalization is for medical purposes under the direct supervision of a bona fide medical doctor. Well, uh, for certain, for specific <laughs> medical treatments, possibly uh, glaucoma and few other treatments where it has been proven to be helpful and also in chemotherapy for people that are uh, cancer patients dying of cancer. Well, were you a former marijuana user yourself? Was I a former marijuana user? Yeah. Yes, I have smoked marijuana. Did you like it? It wasn't too bad. Did you forget to inhale? Pardon? Did you forget to inhale? No, I inhaled <laughs> quite a bit of it. <laughs> cool. <coughs> well, see you later. Okay, thank like you. Like your show. All right. Okay, now we're going to get back to the monetary expert, Byron Dale. And how long did it take you to get over here tonight, Byron? Oh, a couple hours. Yeah, long drive. Okay, now you're an expert. You give testimony in like court cases or? Uh... Well, yeah, the, most of those deal with uh, people that were trying to uh, get the judge to understand uh, why other people have a hard time making their payments on certain things. And it's been my experience that everybody talks about money, everybody uses money, but when you really ask them about money, they really have no understanding of money. Uh -huh. Know where it comes from, how it gets into circulation, what effect that has, what difference it makes. But you ask them where babies come from, and everybody knows. Yeah. And uh, But yet you ask them a, such a common thing as money, well, how does it work? And they tell you money doesn't grow on trees, but where does it come from, and how does it get in circulation? And how does that affect our life? And what does that have to do with we have an outstanding public and private debt of about $25 trillion. But the M1 money supply, and that's the money that you and I can go downtown and spend right at this moment, that we have in our pockets and our checkbooks, the checking accounts, is list a little over a trillion. Uh -huh. Now think about that. Uh, you say our debt is $25 trillion. $25 trillion. Well, the government puts out a figure of roughly, uh, whoever you're talking <coughs> to, is somewhere between... Three and a half and five billion. Okay, now that's the on budget government debt. We're talking about the on budget government debt, the off budget government debt. See, all your FHA and your small business loans and the Gulf War is all run off budget. For example, the Gulf War, they said, well, there's no reason to put that on the budget because it was just a one time expenditure. Well, pretty big one time expenditure. Okay, now we're also talking about the private debt, the debt that you have on your home and your car and your credit cards. And we're talking about the whole nation. Mm -hmm. And that total indebtedness is around $25 trillion according to the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Uh, or Boston, I forget which one it was. And I also, I have a personal letter from me 
from the to me from the Board of Governors. And in 1990, they said that that was about, or 92, I think it was, said that was about 15 trillion. Mm -hmm. So it kind of varies according to who you talk to. But there again, they listed that, and I have that a letter probably right here in front of me of the actual one that they they sent to me, that was signed from the yeah from uh, Lynn S. Fox, a, uh, assistant, a special assistant to the board. Okay, while you're finding that letter, I'm going to take a call real quick because we have them backed up in there and the. The uh, operators, they get on me after a while when there's 10, 20 calls backed <laughs> up, they get nervous. Go ahead, caller, you're on the air. Yeah. Uh, well, see, I bought some marijuana from a guy, you know, and I paid a whole bunch for it, and it was no good. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> well, I wouldn't give your name on the air because you just broke the law and you're admitting it on... Uh, well, I'm just uh, hypothetically speaking. ...on television. <laughs> well... What you can do is you can go down to the police department and turn him in and give his name and address to the police. And then, uh, and, uh, and see what they say about it. Wasn't that what you'd do for him? Oh, you bet. Well, that's a little I bit off the subject. to begin with. That's a little bit off the subject. Fred, probably back in the 30s or 40s, somebody offered it to you and you didn't even know what it was. Did you ever well, think of that? I didn't take it. I never would take it. You being from New York City, I'm sure there was marijuana around. Oh, in New there York was City. marijuana around, and we heard about it in the 50s. Yeah, it's been around for a year, hundreds of years. Well, we're going to clear up one more call, and then he's going to find. Then we're going to talk a little bit, a little bit more about money. Go ahead, caller, you're on the air. Uh, yes, I was kind of wondering where you picked up that cow on the front of your desk there. Oh, does it look familiar? Yeah. It does. Yeah. Where do you think it came from? I don't know. I was just kind of, I kind of wanted to pick one on myself, and I was wondering where you got it from. Well, actually, I borrowed that from a from a store in town that uh, sells cheese and other products, and I was supposed to take it back, and I haven't quite got it back to them yet. Oh. So I got to make a copy of it uh, myself so that I can get the original back to the store because uh, it came off their wall in their uh, store down there on uh, Bracket Nelson's uh, Cheese there. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. Okay, now, I believe you on the letter, but... Not right here it is. You know, money's been around for probably 6,994 uh, years, but at it, least. It's made some major changes that most people haven't thought about. Uh -huh. Because, see, when we first started this country, the, the uh, founding fathers wrote in the Constitution that we should use gold and silver money in the 1792... Coinage Act gives the only definition of a dollar, which is 371 and a quarter grains of silver. So if I was to buy uh, that telephone from you for 10 bucks, I'd have to give you 10 times 371 and a quarter grains of silver. When's the last time you saw anybody do that? It's been a while. There used to be silver certificates on the That's market. That's true. And, of course, we have here the actual bills that show how they've made the changes. But see, it's not so important, really, what you use for money, but when they change the money, they also change the way it goes into circulation. Because when you have a silver coin, for example, and we use that for money, the important thing was how that went into circulation. Because I have one here in my hand, and you can probably see it shine there in, in, the, in the camera. About an ounce. And it's about an ounce, and believe it or not, it's a legal tender coin of 1992. Now, obviously, you wouldn't want to go downtown and spend that for a dollar, but that's what the government has stamped on it, that it's a one-dollar coin. Mm -hmm. Also, I have in my pocket another dollar coin. And as you can see, it probably shines there a little too, but it ain't so bright. Now, you can see it now. And also, now look at the size of those things. Now, would you believe that those things would have the same value? Huh. But your government said it did, stamped right on them. They both have dollar value. Right. And, of course, again, see, that's one of the things we never stop to think about. But the basic thing of what we really need to think about is the principles of how this got into circulation. Now, if you read the 1792 Coinage Act, you'll find out that anyone that could go find some gold or silver bullion in the ground and could dig it out with their labor could take it to the United States Mint, and they would assay it and weigh it and stamp it into coinage free of charge. That meant that now, after you'd performed some labor and combined that with a raw resource of the earth, in this case gold and silver, took it to the government and they monetized it by stamping it in the coin form, 
you could go out and buy something, and now you'd create and put new money into circulation without any debt to anybody, wouldn't you? Over the years, they've changed that on us, and they started out basically when we deposited this in the bank. And the bank said that now, oh, that looks like a good deal, and we'd give you that, and we'd give you a receipt for it to prove you had it, you know, to prove you had it there, right? Uh -huh. Well, pretty quick, just like you said years ago, people began to start using the receipts for money instead of the co instead of the coins. Well, then the smart little banker, he got to watching that and said, well, you know, I could make pretty good money if I would just loan out a few extra receipts. And he soon learned that if he didn't loan out over six or ten dollar receipts for the dollar coin he had there, people didn't catch on. And, of course, that was a very good thing for the banker because now he had one of your coins there and he issued ten receipts for your coin. Mm -hmm. And he issued one to you for the coin but he loaned out nine of them to your neighbors. Oh. Now you see the little difference we've got here? Because now yours represented the silver you got there and was a certificate of deposit. But the others were evidence of debt that you owed the bank. And over time, they took all this kind of money out of circulation and only left in the bank notes that are loaned into circulation by the bank <clears throat> and charge interest on it. Now, it's pretty clear that no matter what you do, if I loaned you this and I was the only producer of this, you'd owe me the silver plus 10% more silver for interest, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Well, if I was the only one to produce that, where would you get the extra 10% to give it back to you? I'd have to borrow somebody else's. Now you're talking. Or you could find maybe somebody that, that had got some borrowed too, and if you could sell him something or trade him something or do something for him, he would give you some of yours. Now, you'd have extra, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. You'd have some that he borrowed, right? Plus that which you borrowed. Now, you could give it back to me, the issuer, from payment of the loan, wouldn't you? And, of course, when I got it back in my hands, it'd be out of general circulation, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, now, where would he be? He wouldn't even have the principal, much less the interest, would he? Oh. Okay, now, he's in deep trouble, isn't he? You don't suppose that's why we're having almost a million bankruptcies a year, and we are. So, when did this uh, shift start? I know back okay, now, in the 30s, okay. there was a gold confiscation. Yes. Now, what happened, the shift started a long time ago, but they consolidated it and made it all under one head when they put in the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. That's when the big bankers, see what happened was, under this principle, you have a natural kind of a thing that happens. People occasionally, always a banker gets just a little greedy and starts loaning more than the six or the ten in. Well, there's always a point in time when people look back and said, wait a minute, I can't believe that he's got that much coins down there. Where did he get them from? And so they say, well, I'm going to take my receipt down and get some of that silver. And of course, obviously, when he's got ten receipts out for one chunk of silver, he has a shortage, doesn't he, if they all go down. That's called a bank run. Okay, now, we used to have bank runs just every once in a while, and we had a big rash of them in the late 1800s, and the last one was, uh, before they put in the Federal Reserve Act, was 1907. And it used to be that the big banker by the name of, uh, escapes my name, his name escapes me right at this J. moment. J.P. Morgan? There you go, J.P. Morgan used to be able to go in and loan these other smaller banks enough to tide them over. But when he passed on, they got a big problem, and they had a really big run. Well, then they got in the Federal Reserve and said, well, now we will have this semi-government-sanctioned bank. We'll call a central bank that can take care of these problems. But we had another big run in the 1930s, and, of course, obviously, that's when Roosevelt went on and said, well, you people got to understand the banks just don't have enough gold, so for your own good, you've got to turn in all your gold, and we'll just use the paper. Because we got to, we just can't let this system collapse because the bankers have made a mistake and loaned you people too much paper. So now, it's not necessarily the paper versus the silver; it's how the money get into circulation. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, if they had a shortage of gold, why didn't they just uh, take these paper bills and go to South Africa or to Russia or to Canada and buy a bunch of gold and put it back in Fort Knox or wherever to cover the. Shortage. Because the trouble with that is they're doing this all over the nation and they're all short of that metal because they're all doing all it. All the world. banks in the world are doing that. Okay, 
now what happened was Roosevelt come on and said, well, we got to take the gold out. And that's when in 1933, they called all the gold out of circulation. And the people was, uh, by law, was forbidden to own any. Yet under the Constitution, that the state cannot make anything but gold and silver coin a tender and payment of debts. And of course, again, it's not so much the gold and silver, it is the principle of what that represented and how it went into circulation. It represented wealth from the ground and your physical labor combined and then turned into an element you can use as money, monetized free of charge by the government. Okay, now I have the actual coin bills here and I, you can't see them because I won't hold them up, but you can see them here yourself. We have the silver certificate and the gold certificate. And it mm -hmm. states right on their face there is dollars of silver and dollars of gold on deposit in the treasury. And they're certificates of deposit. They're not promissory notes. In other words, they state right on their face that you or somebody else deposited that gold and silver coin at the treasury and they give you the receipt. Okay, then they switched the coinage on us. And in 1913, after they put in the Federal Reserve Act, the bills came out. And I have this one here in 1914. It's called National Currency Bill. Now it says the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, Minnesota will pay to the bearer on demand one dollar. But it no longer says a dollar what. But it does say it's a Federal Reserve Bank note. A <clears throat> bank note is always an evidence of debt. Mm -hmm. And that's when they switched our money from evidence of wealth <laughs> to evidence of indebtedness. So we went from a credit system to a debit system. We, no, we went from a debit <laughs> system to a credit system. Oh. We went from evidence of debit is supposed okay. to be a wealth and a credit is a debt, right? Okay, we went from money that represented wealth to now we have money that represents debt. If you and everybody else is not in debt, this money does not exist. Mm -hmm. If you, there's no debt, there's no money under our system. Now, that makes a mathematical problem because, again, it doesn't make any difference what we lo do, whether I loan you, and this one's kind of cute, and I'll just do that to you. I'll loan you this... Uh, uh, Russian ruble. Okay. Now, obviously, that's probably the only gun we got, and that's actually not a Russian ruble, but it's close. It's one of them countries right over there. This is actually the Russian ruble Looks here. Looks like Russian writing. And, uh, okay, now, obviously, I'm the only one here in this room that's got one of them, probably, right? Uh huh. Okay, <laughs> now, I've loaned you that at interest, right? And you've agreed to give me two of them back, right? And if you can't, you've agreed to give me your gun belt for collateral, right? Mm -hmm. So now you either got to give me two of them back, your notes do, or you've got to give me the one you've got back plus your gun belt, don't you? Mm -hmm. Got your gun belt pretty quick and easy, didn't I? Yeah. Because see, mathematically and physically, it's impossible to you to give back more than I loaned in the circulation, isn't it? Sure is. Well, go ahead to your phone. We better take a phone call here and. Uh... Go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Hi, guys. Hello. Oh, how y'all how y'all doing tonight? Real good. good. Yeah, this is Chris. Uh huh. How you doing? Um, Fine. I'd like to know what y'all think about the Whitewater affair. Hmm. The White uh, Water affair. Yeah, with Clinton. Okay, I w we'll uh, each give our opinion. I'll get a kind of an opinion from. Wait the a minute. Mouth. Hey. Yeah. Must that? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Pardon? Yeah. What do y'all think about that? Okay. Just, okay, we're each going to give our opinion on it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Hey. Okay. Well, well get... <clears throat> now let's be honest about it. I think every man under our form of government innocent until proven guilty. But now it's an interesting, isn't it, that the only man that can appoint the prosecutor is the man he's going to investigate. Now, if I was going to be investigated and I was going to appoint my friend to do the investigation, you really think that we'd have a fair and honest investigation? Well, I'd probably be hoping that you'd help cover something up. <laughs> I think so. And see, that's you. You he hit basically on a very one of the the real faults in our system, the way it operates, other than the money, is right now there is no way to prosecute government except government to do it themselves. Do you know that if the state's attorney commits a crime, there's not anybody in the country that can bring charges against him? except himself or possibly a judge who could convene a grand jury. There's nobody else that can bring charges against them. Now think about that. Once they learn that, do you really think they have any respect at all for the law? Hmm. It does cheapen it because there's no 
who's policing the police? That's Nobody's no can, nobody can police the police, and that's yeah. the problem with the system. Nobody in the chicken coop except us chickens. That's right. And yeah. see, under our original form of government, we the people was to have grand jury rights, where we could take a complaint, and then we could have the government prosecuted if we felt they weren't upholding the law. And of course they're not, because the law that the government has to uphold is the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And they pay absolutely no attention to it, except when it suits their own purposes. And there again is a basic fault that why that we have all the problems we got with the money and everything else, because you can't prosecute bad government officials. Go ahead. Okay, Fred, uh, we, we I, get I, your opinion, then I we're going to take another there's call. there's smoke, there's fire. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, if there wasn't, why illegally did someone go in and grab the foster files and then trash some of them? As usual, Fred, you're so true. Well, you know, Fred, I just read a very lengthy report from Washington. I briefly mentioned it on the program last week that uh, there's some people out there very serious of looking at uh, starting some uh, inquiries about impeachment. And I must have read a good 20 different uh, charges that they are tying uh, Clinton in on. And now they're, they're starting to say the word murder in that foster case instead of suicide. And uh, they're probably going to exhume that body and look it over a little closer. Um, so things are heating up a little bit out there. And of course, the Republicans smell blood. You know, it's obvious that they're going to go after it like the Democrats went after Nixon 20 a little over 20 years ago. So uh, it could get rough, but you have to realize the Democrats control the House mm -hmm. and uh, the Senate. Well, hasn't uh, Mr. Blim from uh, Blim or something like that from Texas already got six or eight million signatures to impeach Clinton? Well, there's over 10 million Over now. 10 million now. Over 10 million. Mm -hmm. Well, that's quite a chunk of the population. Yeah. And, and if there's, there's been no publicity in... Uh, any of the press or the media that I've seen except one paper, and that's the Wanderer of St. Paul. Huh. Well, Fred, we're going to take that call while you're wandering. Go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Yeah, I really enjoy your program. Thank you. I wish you were on more than once a week. Well, we try to be, but this is public. Anyway, that boy kind of stole my question because I was, I was wondering about Watergate. Now, are the taxpayers going to have to pay for this investigation? And do you think that Clinton is guilty? Well, the taxpayers will have to pay for it. Now, the, uh, under the Iran-Contra affair, there was, what, close to $10 million spent? Fred, maybe more. I don't know, but it's a huge amount of money. Maybe $100 and, million would be more. After. And they couldn't get any real smoking gun. They made a few accusations, but for that kind of money, you expect to see some heads roll. Well, it didn't roll during the Nixon administration or the the Bush administration. So the the uh, the executive branch of government has learned since the Nixon uh, Watergate years that there are ways around this, and you can stonewall it at least till you get out of office. And now uh, Clinton's got a, he's got about three years where he's going to have to stonewall this. But uh, Nixon did a pretty good job for several years, and uh, uh, Reagan did for probably about uh, three four years. He stonewalled it and. Bush handled it for four years, so, you know, if uh, Clinton really wants to, uh, with with his friend doing the special investigating, uh, they could uh, at least forestall this until after the elections of 96. If, uh, if personally, I think there is some problems there. I don't know if they're impeachable, but there was uh, some very serious uh, uh, things that happened prior to Clinton becoming president. Now the the problems are arising that they're trying to cover up a lot of the past problems, and that's that's where they're getting into trouble now with the present situation. Is is because they brought in uh, people that are involved in the executive branch now to uh, help with the cover up of things that happened as far back as ten years ago. So that's what's causing the problems. If you, the callers, really want to see something done about this, just call your congressmen and your senators so often and so heavy demand an open and public hearings on this that they have to act if they're going to stay in office that's when you'll really get down to the bottom of the truth of it uh -huh. the chairman of the house banking committee is supposed to hold hearings on this a one-day hearing mr foley said 
Yeah. What do you think about it, caller? I know that the Christians are really praying, and I, I believe myself that if he is guilty, I think he should be caught. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the other hand, though, you hate to see the, the leader of the supposedly the most powerful nation in the, uh, in the uh, world go down in flames because it, it doesn't look good to the rest of the world. But, uh, but it he might sure look, wasn't the man I thought he was. It might look better, though, if the rest of the world saw that we, we really did stand up for justice and honesty. Yeah, that's true, too. No. Now, what do you think of his health plan? Well, I think it's going to cost a lot more than we can afford. It might be the thing that really bankrupts America. Well, you, if you look to my left, I guess would be probably your right on your screen. Fred over there is pushing 77 year old, years old, and according to the Clinton health care plan, they will withdraw health care from Fred because of rationing. If he gets in a crisis situation, they'll just say, Pull the plug. He's had a nice, uh, long life. Well, Fred, because of modern medicine, could live to be a hundred and still be active. And and uh, you know, there's there's thousands of people in their 80s, 90s, and even into their hundreds that are still active in this country because of modern medicine. But under the rationing socialism of the Clinton administration, that plan, if that goes into effect, people on Fred's end of the spectrum and the unborn are both going to be slaughtered very large numbers. Well, we're hoping it don't go through. Well, if you really understand it, it's not a health care crisis anyway. It's a money crisis. Because think about it. Do we have a shortage of doctors or hospitals or no. nurses or insurance companies? No. What we all. have is a shortage for some people to pay for those services, don't we? Uh -huh. Well, why do we have a shortage of money in a country that supposedly has the greatest natural resources of any country in the world? And see, everything except money is a result of labor combined with the raw resource of the earth. This book, the cups, the desk, everything is a result of those two things except money. Money is created totally different. It's created out of thin air and loaned into circulation by the banks as a debt to all of us, which means that makes when you add the interest, there's an automatic shortage of money, regardless of how much there is. Now you think about that. It doesn't make any difference whether I loan you a dollar, and that's the only dollar you got, and you owe me a dollar and ten cents, you're short ten cents. If I loan you a trillion dollars, now I charge you ten percent interest, you're just short more than you was in the first place, aren't you? Pretty soon, a trillion here and a trillion there, you're talking big money. Big bucks. And it's all shortage, see? Okay. And that's why we have the twenty-five trillion dollars worth of indebtedness, public and private, and only one trillion dollars with money supply. And of course, obviously, that's not enough to cover the obligations that we all have to incur to live and have a medium exchange. Once we get down and understand the root of the problem, now you said money with the love of money. I mean, the money, it's not the money's not the root of the problem, it's the love of money. And how and who controls the issuance of money is the problem. And American people are going to have to get down and start understanding how their monetary system works if they're going to get to the root of all these other problems and start straightening them out too. Okay, is that, did that help you, caller? Yeah, but I still hope that the health, care, the health care plan doesn't go through. And I have a question for Fred. Yes. Do you think we're going to make it to the, use, to the year of 2000 before Jesus returns to Earth? Uh, well, I've been looking at John Ankerberg on the Family Channel and looking at... Uh, uh, Jack Van Impey on CBS on Sunday nights. And uh, I believe that Jesus is going to be coming a lot sooner than we think. Now, maybe not before 2000, but God knows how s much longer it's going to take. With all the things that are happening in the world today, it would seem that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled. But it could be possible. All you yes. got to do is keep your eyes on Israel. Whatever happens in Israel will tell you how short the time is. Because the way things are going now with the gay rights and just different things, that things don't look good at all. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. Sir. You're right. Okay. You know, speaking of that, Fred, I saw a uh, archaeological special the other day on uh, 
one of the TV channels. Discovery Channel? And they were trying to find Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know they were looking in the Dead Sea. Well, the Dead Sea is the deepest spot on Earth. And it's brackish salt water, and it's, they said they would probably have to dig hundreds of millions of tons of this brackish stuff out there to get down to where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be, to just find one, maybe one uh, piece of pottery. They've never found one piece of writing. The only thing they have is what's in the scriptures on it, and uh, uh, some of the writers from, the, uh, from uh, many thousands of years ago who spoke of what happened over there. Yes. But... Uh, that, uh, but you got to keep your eyes on Israel. What's going on over there? Keep your eye on the ball. That's where. Uh, that's what'll tell you is how close we're getting. Now we're going to take another call, and then we're going to get in more into uh, what money is and uh, what's the solution to this whole problem. Well, go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Good evening. Uh, I was wondering what's your take on the the uh, practice of the government and current services baseline budgeting compared to how much better off we might be with a zero-based budgeting system. And I guess I'll just listen to your comments then. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Well, I don't know exactly what he's talking about there, other than maybe yeah. he's talking about zero, a balanced budget, but I'll zero, let... Zero-based zero budgeting, I think, is the way to go. I'll let... Uh, well, Byron. first off, we ought to find out what it is we're budgeting. Now, think about it. If the government, as most people believe, prints all the money, and are the first issue and the first user, if you had a print and press in your backyard, would you be in debt to anybody? I wouldn't think so. Well, then why is the government? They got 16 of them down there. 24 hours a day. Uh, 20, oh, yeah, they can print 5,800 bills per hour. Now, they just print ones up to 120s and so on, but they could print $1,000 bills, couldn't they? Mm -hmm. They used to print $500 and $1,000 bills, in fact. Mm -hmm. Well, now, obviously, if the government pr is printing the money like everybody believes, how could they possibly have a debt? Why does they even need to tax us? Because, see, again, by all these questions, you're forgetting to get down to the root of the problem. What is it you're budgeting? What are you using for money? I had a guy say the other day, well, the problem is that we're giving too much money to foreign countries. My question to him was, what did you give away? And, you know, he didn't know. Well, how can you give too much away if you don't even know what you give away? What are we giving away? Well, actually, you're giving away the bank credit, and then they take on borrowed bank credit, just thin air, they buy the actual goods, the wheat and the corn and these things, clothes that's manufactured, other things. But are we short of any of them? Have you noticed a shortage of grain or clothes or toys or anything in our stores lately? No. Well, then obviously they didn't give so much away they shorted us, did they? No. So then obviously that's not the problem, is it? See, if you give away just simply of your excess, you can't get in trouble, can you? So again, you have to get down to the understanding of what is really going on. And what's going on is smoke and mirrors and deception. And of course, once you understand that, and if people would literally quit worrying about when Jesus is going to come and take control of what's going on. You know, you talk about the gay rights and the homosexuals, there's less than 1% of them. How come they have such an agenda? How come they have so much influence? There's more than 1% of people like myself and Fred and you. Why don't we have the same influence? Because, see, we're all sitting back waiting for somebody else to solve our problems for us. We want to say, oh, I don't have to take responsibility. Jesus is going to take that for me. And that isn't what the Bible says. Now, I didn't say he wasn't going to come. But he said it's up to us to make the choices between good and evil and act upon it. And if you sit around on your duff and just wait for him to do it, you're not going to get the rewards you think you're going to get when he does come. So you better get off your duff and quit worrying about it because no man knows the time or the place anyway. So why worry about something you don't know, can't understand, and you can't do anything about it anyway? Why don't you start thinking about things you can do something about and standing up and taking responsibility for your own life, and maybe you wouldn't have to have all the problems you've got now. So now you're talking to us as a nation and individual. Absolutely. You can't separate or the two. Or as a world, because we're all tied in. Uh, everything's tied in. The money is, anyway. Well, of course, the money's a tied in. Actually, the th I bought a new pair of slippers today. And guess where they was made? China. China. Everything's made in China. My wife bought a new pair, a new coat uh, Christmas two ago. And I got to looking, and every coat in that store was made in China. 
Well, now all the brand names. That's what Great Nixon did for us, see, when he opened up the relationship. Now they're going to do some more with Mexico. Now, how much do you think you can buy after a while if everything is manufactured someplace else? Pretty soon there won't be any. That's, there won't that's be any, right. Anybody in this country making enough money to buy the products. And do you in. know why that they opened up NAFTA and all that to Mexico? Because when Volcker pulled back the credit to bang inflation down in the early 80s, he also pulled out the money out of circulation, which meant the money got pulled out down from Mexico, too. And they was about to default on the big banks, which would have brought down the banking system and the collapse that's almost intimate if we don't do something about it and make some common sense decisions. And so they had to do something to protect the banks again. And that's what we're all doing. Everything in our government is geared to protect the banking system. Because obviously, it's only those who can create money out of thin air that can always put up two or three million dollars every other year for all these congressmen to run, isn't it? Think about it, see? Always, he who controls the money controls most everything else. We got another call, though. What I wanted to ask is what, maybe you can think about this a second, what, uh, if all this interest is being paid on this national debt, where is that interest money going to? To the bankers. If it's if paper, if money is created out of thin air from the print, printing presses, then well, who are we paying all this interest to? You're not. And I'll tell you why. Take your caller and I'll all explain right. to you why. Go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Hi. How you doing? All right. Uh, I just like to say I like your show a lot. Well, thank you. And uh, I was wondering if you took my advice on what to, what else you could do with that swab, you know, for the that Flav and Pop thing? Uh-huh. Yeah, I called last week, and I was wondering if you took my advice on that. Yeah, we sure did. What? What? Yeah, we sure did. Yeah? Uh-huh. Well, thanks a lot. <coughs> well, Fred, you know, before the show, I told you and Chris and Cliff to get them bees back in their hives. So here you go again. Get them back in their hives before the show and close the door. And you wouldn't listen. So let's get them back in there. All right. Now, now we want to know what all this, the government says that, what is it, something like 30% of, yep. of the government, yep. Yep. Of, the, of the budget every year goes to pay interest on a debt. That's true. And, that, and on the other hand, there's the United States Treasury is sitting out there printing $100 bills and $20 bills 24 hours a day, probably 360 days a year. Or more well at least probably that okay and the first question is you got to understand what happens to those bills after they're printed obviously the government just don't spend them in the circulation or they wouldn't have debt would they no what they do is they sell them to the Federal Reserve banks for four cents a bill whether it's a dollar bill or a hundred dollar bill and I know that for a fact because I wrote them a letter here a while back when I began to understand this, I under first I got a letter from somebody that said that uh, the after the Federal Reserve or after the Bureau of Printing prints the money, they sell it to the bankers for a penny a bill. Well, I thought that was an awful good deal, so I sent him a dollar bill and asked him to send me a hundred hundred dollar bills. That's what it would be if I got bought a dollar hundred dollar bill for a penny. I, so I sent him the dollar and I wrote him a letter and I said, please find and close the one dollar bill or. 100 cents. With this, I wish to purchase 100 hundred dollar bills. I understand this is the price you charge the Federal Reserve Banks to print them for their use. I must remind you that if you don't honor this and continue to sell only to the Federal Reserve Banks, then I will seek legal action for violation of antitrust laws. Uh -huh. We're not supposed to have any monopolies in this country, right? I guess not. Well, then how can they can have a complete monopoly on buying hundred dollar bills for four cents or, or a penny? They wrote me back and they said, well, I'm not quite right because the Bureau of Printing and Engraving produces the nation's paper currency and sells it to the Federal Reserve System for $20.60 per thousand notes. So now it's up to 2.6 cents. And this letter was dated uh, December 14th of 1982 to me from the Department of Treasury from M.M. M. Snyder, acting executive assistant. Okay, now, a little over $20 which per 1,000 notes. notes. Which is now, two point what kind of notes were they? Hundred dollar notes or one? All the same. Don't make any difference. Uh, well, sure. The printing cost on a hundred dollar note is the same as on so a one dollar note. All they're charging is the ink and the paper. That's correct. Just and like any print job that you would labor. do it. 
Uh, just like let's, any print let's, job. Let's get in on this deal. Larry. <laughs> get yeah. Okay. Now they told me. However, the money. They, are, however, the notes are not money, until they are monetized and issued by a Federal Reserve Bank. So, see, once the government prints the notes, they're not even money, until the Federal Reserve Banks come in and pick them up and monetize them. So I wrote them a letter and said, well, how do you monetize that? Do you sprinkle holy water on them or something? When are you having your next monetizing ceremony? Can I come watch? Never did get an answer to that one. Uh -huh. But I did get some information later, and they say the Federal Reserve monetizes that when it's loaned into circulation. When you borrow it or borrow from the bank, that now becomes money. Okay? Now, the notes... So, the, let me ask you first. Now, does, sure. Does the... Uh, is that the only way this money gets into circulation is through loans? That's the only way. So who does the loan? Is the loan back to the government then? Oh, and to you and the government and to I and to Fred. I'll bet all of us has borrowed some money. And I suppose some of it's even given to pay off the old debt. Well, absolutely. You issue a note to pay off the old note. Uh huh. That's what you do. It's called rolling over the note, isn't it? So now, now monetizing used to be, say, 100 years ago, used to be those... They used to monetize it with the silver and the gold backing, right? Yes, and when they actually took something physical and stamped it into money form free of charge. That was the old-fashioned monetizing. Yes, and that was wealth monetization mm -hmm. because that took a combination of man's labor and a raw resource of the earth, and the government monetized it by making a certain standard weight and purity, didn't they? Mm -hmm. And they did that free of charge under the 1792 Coinage Act, Section 14. Okay, but now when the banks... They buy this for four cents. It, well, used to, it was a penny, and then it went up to two and probably three. And the last letter I got from Congressman Penny in Minnesota it said four cents. Okay, but in material, they also have to put up collateral issued to, the, when, to get the Federal Reserve notes. Okay, now here's an actual bill that goes right along with that letter, and you can take it and read on it. And it says, uh, to obtain notes, a Federal Reserve Bank must pledge collateral equal to the face value. I'm reading right from the letter from the Treasury. Collateral must consist of the following assets, a loan or in combination, gold certificates, special drawing rights certificates, United States of Government securities. That's what you're looking at. And that says right on its face, backed by bonds deposited with the Treasury, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now the way this actually works, to originally start the money system expanding now, the government will issue an indebtedness on itself, a bond, that they promise to pay back later. The Federal Reserve, one of the 12 Federal Reserve banks, will simply write a check upon itself on account of where there's no funds and simply create the money as a book and entry to buy a million-dollar bond. Hmm. Okay, now when that is, goes to a bank, you know, obviously somebody that gets that deposit in their bank, don't they? Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's a brand new deposit from the bank, and when they send it back to the Fed, they just simply mark it paid and enter in a million dollars into the books of the bank. That's a brand new deposit that now they can loan out six times that much to you and I. Hmm. And that's how money is created and put into circulation for you and I to use. And if it's not borrowed, it's not there for you and I to use. Go ahead. Let me take another call here and we'll see. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Hi. Um, since you guys saw me talk about money, I have a money-related question. All right. Uh, I recently read that the uh, luxury tax that was uh, put into commission during the, I believe, the Bush administration, during all these other taxes, that that was recently repealed uh, due because uh, people stopped buying luxury items and therefore they weren't earning any revenues and it was hurting sales and whatnot. Do you guys think that that was perhaps talked about, discussed, and perhaps even planned back when the uh, bill was being considered? Well, I'll defer to, refer this to Byron to see what he has Well, I guess you'd have to show to me for a fact that that tax repealed. Most taxes I see have an almost eternal life. Uh -huh. But uh, it could have been, it could not have been. The boat, the boat tax on boats and so forth has been, has been re repealed rescinded, yes. On the real fancy boats. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because it drove because people lost their jobs up here in Wisconsin. Because they couldn't afford to buy the real boats, the big fancy ones. Yeah. Right. Okay, so but that's... it was a luxury tax, and it was hurting right. the luxury boats. Okay, so that, that goes to show you that now you can control any industry by how much you tax them or how little you tax them, right? Mm -hmm. So now, again, because of the control of the money, you can control absolutely who's in business and who isn't, is it? 
Again, you have to get back. See, that's what everybody misses. They want to talk about the effects of money, not what money is and how it's put into circulation that allows certain people to have total control of the economy. And that's what we've got to get back to. And see, that's where I'm a little different than everybody else because I focused my study not on how much taxes are paid or what's done with the tax money, but what it is that you're actually taxed with or what do they take from you when, they pay, when you pay taxes. Do they come out and take something physically from you when you pay taxes? How do you actually pay taxes? What do you actually do when you pay taxes? Usually write a check. And that check got into your bank account in only one way. Checkbook money is only created when somebody goes into debt. So see, if you're not in debt, you can't even pay taxes. Now, you may not personally be in debt because if Fred over here would go in debt and you would get some of his money, you would have money now without you personally being in debt, wouldn't you? But Fred would still have the debt and he wouldn't have the money, wouldn't he? And see, this is the thing that everybody has missed. They don't go back far enough to understand the root cause of the problem. And what we're out here, we're trying to trim all the leaves off the tree to reshape it, when what we've got to do is go back and saw off the root to kill the poison that's, that's causing us all damage. We're looking at your letter here, uh, $20.60 per 1,000 notes. Mm -hmm. Now, if those were all $100 notes, that'd be $100,000, and they... Sold them for 20 bucks. That's, That's a pretty right. good deal. Now, wouldn't you like to get in on some of that? Yes, yeah. absolutely. I think, well, I'm sure Fred would. He I could use could 100 grand. It. You got 20 bucks, Fred? And think about it. Not only that, you could spend it all but 20 bucks, and then you could go redo it, couldn't you? Yeah. That's You'd right. never, yeah, think or about that. Or you could take the 100,000 and go back and buy 100,000. <laughs> okay, now let's go on because on that point, Let I me want take to share this call first. Go ahead, take the call now. Go ahead, call. You're on the air. Hello? Hello. Yeah, Chuck. Yeah. Yeah, uh, excellent show tonight. Thank you. Uh, Byron, many compliments to you. Thank mm. you. Uh, just I got a few items here. Um, have you ever thought of, of taking what you're going through tonight and putting together a school lesson for some grade school kids and try to get that incorporated into the educational system? I have a guy in California, a chiropractor, that's doing that right now with his son's fifth grade uh class in grade school in California so yeah we could if we wanted to do that we could just go have him write up the whole uh, would, session that he's taught his uh, the, the kids in class out there th that would be excellent because the, the, the grade schoolers would would grasp this very easy uh, much more so than our politicians I think well but see the trouble of it with that is that you're right but the grade school kids can't do anything about it. The politicians can if we put enough pressure on them. Right, but in 15 to 20 years, the grade schoolers will be calling the shots. Well, but They'll have I'm a good not... basic education of what the problem with money is. I'm not sure we can stand to wait 20 years before we solve this problem. Yeah. Okay, the, the, the next thing is, um, do you have any recommended readings or publications? And do you have any sort of practical advice for for the, the, the average person, if you will, and uh, are you hopeful or, or are you dismal as far as the future goes? Oh, I'm very hopeful. And the reason I'm hopeful is because we, we have, well, we have first this Tales from the Treasury, which is a compilation of the letters that I wrote to congressmen and their, or to the Treasury and their answers on the money issue. So the, what you have here is absolutely letters from the United States Treasury and the Mint answering my questions about money and that's basically what I use to explain this to congressmen. Also, we have here, and I charge $7 for this if you want to order it from me. Also, we have here the Money Reform Act. Now, this is the solution that we're trying to get implemented, and it's been hand-delivered to all 535 congressmen and senators, and we've had meetings with several of them, and I have, again, meetings on in April with 12 of them already scheduled to go through this act and try to get them to, we need a sponsor before we can get it moved on. And of course, what we try to do is get as many people to call these congressmen, and we have a group, a hotline, and I don't have that with me right now, that we're going to put out and try to get a lot of pressure on certain congressmen just before they meet them. And this Monetary Reform Act, which I normally sell for $5, is for the, a letter that we wrote to the congressman that explains this, and then an actual bill in bill form for them to introduce and to pass, which would be basically the solution. And we'll address the solution right quick because we're running out of time. The solution is very simple. You go back to the exact same principles that you had with gold and silver. 
That's when man combines his labor with a raw resource of the earth and it's monetized by the government free of charge. And the quickest and most effective way to do this at this point in time would be to monetize the infrastructure. In other words, like the city of Eau Claire or other towns, the state of Wisconsin or Minnesota would simply build roads just like they do now. They put out a contract, a bid, they build it to certain specifications, and then when they accept the bid and they start building, they start paying them. Only now they tax us from money that we borrowed the banks to do it. it the, under the new, uh, under the bill, the Money Reform Act, the government would monetize those roads by printing the bill money and giving it to the county and the township and the state to pay the workers. That way the roads would lay there as a public uh, right for all of us to drive on without taxation and the worker would get paid and the money would go into circulation exact same principles in gold and silver. And that would be the quickest way to change this. Then if you want to go back to gold and silver, you would simply tax an excess tax on the bankers because everybody would have to pay off their loans just like now, maybe with a reduced interest rate. And then the banker would get back the money he created out of thin air with the labor money or the wealth money that you, we put into circulation building the roads with the labor. Then he would be taxed an XX profit tax for the excess profit he would get from that, which would flow back into the government to build more roads. And you'd just recycle your money and then actually for the change, honestly launder it and you'd make it from debt money to wealth money. Okay, in doing that, if you wanted to go back to gold and silver, you would have them pay a percentage of that in gold and silver bullion. Once it got back into the hands of the government, they would simply monetize it and spend it back into circulation just like the other. Mm -hmm. And you'd have the whole problem solved and you wouldn't have any upheaval either. Sounds like a good, good solution. We've got plenty of gold and silver to do this, right? Well, only, see, first you have to get rid of a lot of the debt. And see, we really don't have inflation like everybody thinks we do. What we have is a spread between raw products and finished products. And I have a chart here that shows you how many it, this used to be how many bushels of wheat it took to buy a, uh, a car in 1929. In 1923, pardon me, a man that I know personally bought a brand new Buick car and he sold his wheat for $2 a bushel and it took him 1,150 bushel of wheat to push it to car. In 1990, the same man went back and another, bought another Buick car, only this one was made out of fiberglass instead of steel. He sold his wheat for $2.30 a bushel, and it cost him 10,000 bushel of wheat to have the car. Hmm. And of course, in the same thing with cattle. Now this one here is in 1959, it took three and a half cattle to buy a pickup, and in 1990, it took 21 and a half cattle to buy a pickup, fat steers or, 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 or milk cows. Mm -hmm. Okay, so see, you can see the spread, and why that spread is because if we stop and think, if you buy a quarter pound of hamburger for 50, 50 cents, cook it and put it in a bun, and sell it for a dollar and a half, you can cover your ox breaking expenses, can't you? Mm -hmm. Well, if they now add your interest to that, and they tax you another 25 cents, or 25 cents more for interest and 25 cents more for taxes, well, now you have to charge $2 for your hamburger, don't you? Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is exactly what we're seeing, and this is what we're seeing in all businesses. This is why we have the spread between the, the farmers are still getting basically the same price they always were, and the raw pro the finished product is higher and higher. The car, the tractor, the clothes, the shoes are way up there, but yet the farmer, who is always the producer of the basic raw products that does everything, is back getting the same basic price he did because of all the spread trying to get everybody's interest and in taxes into the system. And one more question. Remember, you ask who got the interest. Basically nobody, because the interest never exists. You only pay your interest with part of his principal. Okay, and the bank takes the interest as their profit. They spend part of it back into circulation, but that still does not equal his total interest bill, does it? No. So after a while, he has to file bankruptcy, doesn't he? Okay, now the bank has to write off the total indebtedness against their profit. So that wipes all of their interest, too. But they do come out because they always end up with title of the property, don't they? That's why you and I own less and less, and the banks control more and more. Well, I wish we had about two more hours to talk about it. We're, we're, we're starting to run over now. And, and uh, see, at 10 o'clock, we try to release people from this show so they can tune back and watch the 10 o'clock news on the other one of the other local channels in town. So we wanted to thank you, Byron, for being here. and. Of course, as usual, Fred Stafford, uh, my trusty sidekick, and uh, everybody in the control room, thanks for uh, helping, and we
appreciate the phone calls tonight, and uh, we'll see you again next week right here at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on the Cow Report. I've been your host, Chuck Lee, and we'll see you. Good we'll evening. See you Thursday at 6 p.m. here next week. Okay. On the 17th.